Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Downright Capable Talk Show. I just wanted to start our show off with saying that I apologize if I'm a little bit slower to the draw today. I have this bad boy with me today. I had nerve repair surgery two days ago, so I'm working with one hand today, but I <laughs> promise to have an awesome show for you today. So again, welcome to the Downright Capable Talk Show, Changing the Way Others View Down Syndrome. My name is Marla Morasco. I am with my co-host, Brian Herndon. We are both parents to boys with Down Syndrome. And if you are watching this on the replay, please know that you can still comment and you can share the show. And please, if you could do us a favor, if you are watching this on the replay, just write replay in the comments and maybe where you're actually tuning in from. We just like to get a gauge on where our audience is tuning in from. And if you are new to our show, welcome. Let me just give you a little history about why we created our show. So Brian and I first started talking about this idea about changing the narrative around the way society views individuals with Down syndrome. We wanted to um, have them look at the person first and look at their capabilities and not their disabilities. And that's the whole premise to the show. And we're really excited about our speaker with us today because she represents an organization that that represents that very thought. So, Brian, welcome to our show. And can you introduce our guest today? You bet. Thanks, Marla. I would be honored to introduce our guest to us. Um, this is Sarah Jo Soldo Vieri. Did I say yeah. that right? OK. Uh -huh. um, she is the manager of the Inclusive Education Task Force with the National Down Syndrome Society. So we are super glad you're here with us today, Sarah Jo. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Good. Um, so uh, you work for the National Down Syndrome Society. Let me get that yep. right. Yep. So for viewers who may not be familiar with that organization, tell us a little bit about what it is and what it does. Yeah, so the National, the National Down Syndrome Society, our mission is to be the leading human rights organization for all individuals with Down Syndrome. And our, so through that mission, we support folks from um, a prenatal diagnosis to end of life care. My program that I run, I'm the manager of inclusive education programming, so really hits that uh, interven early intervention to post-secondary. Mm -hmm. um, so I manage our amazing inclusive education task force, which is made up of parents and lawyers and world-renowned researchers and, and professors to inclusive educators and inclusive administrators, to um, to paraprofessionals and speech paths. So we really, anybody who has a stake in creating inclusive education, um, making that become a reality, then we also support families with individual IEPs and due process cases, all the way to supporting school systems on making systemic change for inclusive, um, for inclusive education. Awesome, wonderful. Wonderful. Um, go ahead, Marla. Yeah, sure. So um, I am fortunate to be on the Inclusive Education Task Force with Clara Jo, and I, I think we're doing such amazing work, and I'm just honored to be on, on that task force with her. Sarah Jo, can you tell us how long have you been with the National Down Syndrome Society? Yeah, so I have been with the National Down Syndrome Society. I took over the program in May 2017. I first was um, the Tayshoff Inclusive Education Fellow, and then I transitioned to a full-time role. And I, I want to say again how how amazing our Inclusive Ed Task Force is. They really are a backbone of the Inclusive Education Program. They are the ones who um, vet everything, create all of the resources, where they're the ones who help troubleshoot ideas and policy. Um, so I came on initially in 2017 to take that over. Um, initially, it was just education and we were able to transition that quickly to inclusive education because we know how important um, standing up for inclusive education is. So going on almost, it'll be three years in May that I've been lucky to be with NDSS. That's awesome. Thank you to have you. Congratulations. That's exciting. <laughs> so I've heard you talk a little bit about inclusive education and I know um, you know, in, in the, I'm a, I'm a professor, I teach special education courses. Mm -hmm. We talk about inclusion all the time. And, and I know in the Down syndrome community, we talk about inclusion all the time. Mm -hmm. What do you, how would you define inclusive education? What, what does inclusion mean? Oh, what a great question. Cause it's so, it is one of those things I think we have to operationally define for our community, for our educators, for our policymakers. And so inclusive education at the bare bones is that everybody is educated together regardless of ability. 
Mm -hmm. Our students with Down syndrome are educated alongside their peers without disabilities. Looking at how our school system is currently set up, the only place for that to happen is the general education classroom. So inclusion would be students with Down syndrome or other disabilities being educated in the general education classroom. This, of course, goes beyond beyond just having students in the classroom, because really inclusion is, if we're able to move to the next level of this, mm -hmm. welcoming, embracing, and planning for the unique needs of all students. And I often say this to the schools that I'm working with on a systemic level of while I'm here to talk about students with Down syndrome, this transcends ability, this transcends to our students who are sixth grade levels above, this transcends to our, student, our English language learners who our students of color to any type of um, not represented group. Um, right. right. Yeah. So awesome. I'm glad you. I'm. I'm glad you kind of defined it that way because I think it's it's important. You know, I'm I'm a huge advocate for my own child to be fully included, yeah. and I know there's a lot of parents out there that that are on that same page. I know Marla is as well, and yeah. and um and I I think though that sometimes people um are not always in favor of that um and mm -hmm. and so you know i think in the down syndrome community there's there's more support for that not all uh disability communities have that same feeling mm -hmm. um and so and, and i and i want to respect that and i think it's important to respect that but um but i'm glad that you defined it and and in, in, in a way that that really truly is full inclusion in the classroom for kids Absolutely. Absolutely. And we look at, you know, countries, I say this all the time, we look at countries like Italy who have been fully inclusive across the board. Mm -hmm. And they're not saying just students with Down syndrome, just students with autism, just students with CP, all students are fully included. And so while absolutely we respect that not every disability community feels the same way, um, I can say as an educator, we're, when we're truly inclusive, we're inclusive of all students. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Right. Good. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so going out there, I was so intrigued with what you were saying, yeah, Sarah Jo. Yeah, no, it's perfect. <laughs> so, Sarah Jo, for a family that's actually advocating for their child, how can they work with the NDSS and yourself and the task force and, you know, benefit from what you guys are doing? Absolutely. So let's start with our task force. They um, have created a plethora and are continuing to create. In fact, I have a list of things I need to get up on our website that the task force has just has just torn out and made for us that are really sim are really user friendly things like I or um, acronyms. So if you're going into an IEP meeting, you're not sure. We have all these acronyms, all these letters thrown around. We have really user friendly things that you can review and bring with you, so that you are able to just kind of speak the same language as the schools. We also then have resources, right? Because we're about supporting the whole team for our educators. So if you have an educator that says, I just don't know how to do this. Well, great, here are all these resources from NDSS's Inclusive Ed Task Force. Um, so you can that can all be found on ndss.org. Awesome. Now, if you need some more support, you can contact myself directly in our Inclusive Education team, and we can actually do everything from sit with you and talk through your IEP to attending IEP meetings with you to sitting down with your teachers and teaching teams and do either a training or help them modify and accommodate these lesson plans. I mean, I get calls, text messages, FaceTimes every day from educators who are like, I have to teach this unit on the Alamo and I don't know how to do it for this student. And so we troubleshoot and we create it together. Um, we want to support right the whole team and that includes the school. Awesome. And I think that's good to know that that the parents actually hear or our audience list is hearing that the teachers want to reach out or reaching out to you because they want to, you know, do right by the child. But they, they're being honest. They're being transparent. I don't know how to do this. And so for them to actually reach out to the NDSS and say, look, we, we really could use your help. I mean, kudos to them because there's not many school districts that will actually do that. Right. Absolutely. And in some cases, it's, okay, we have a student and we want to remediate these skills. What can we do at home? And I help families come up with educational plans at home to right. supplement what's happening at school. Sometimes that's over the summer. Sometimes that's during the school year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I'm glad you said that, that just even thinking as a parent, you know, I'm, I'm also an educator, so I have an interesting dynamic going on here, but, mm -hmm. but most parents are not. And so they don't know a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm glad that the NDSS has that, um, 
that resource really for mm-hmm. parents to reach out to and even to share with their IEP team. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know, so, so that those teachers can reach out. And I'm glad you said that, that, you know, sometimes the teachers reach out and say, hey, I'm teaching this unit on how do I, absolutely. you know, accommodate or modify. Absolutely. And we've seen for some of these schools I've been working with for, you know, going on the third year that we're now seeing, hey, I don't, it's not a question about our students with Down syndrome. Maybe it's a question about our gifted and talented student. And I just need support on differentiating as a whole, which is really, really great to see kind of that lasting arc of differentiation. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So kind of going off of that theme of parents and, mm-hmm. and you know, I, you're, I don't know if you're a part of the some of the Down syndrome pages on Facebook or yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I assume you probably are. Yeah. But um, what advice? I, I mean, so many. You know, we we the human nature is we 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 put out there what we want to complain about. Mm-hmm. You know, and, mm-hmm. and 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 I get that. And and those pages are so helpful for parents because we can connect mm-hmm. and give our experiences, and we can share our our, our you know experiences and, and resources. What would you or what advice would you give to parents and caregivers who face that daily struggle of fighting for greater inclusion? Because yeah. it seems like it just doesn't end. Absolutely. Well, the first thing I would say is that it is worth it in the end. Mm-hmm. It is a fight that we believe is worth fighting for. And I won't sugarcoat and say that it's going to always be easy. Um, right. it's, it's not. And I think right. the first thing to do is find your community, find the folks who you can call after a bad day when things are just went awful and, and talk to who will really understand. Um, then the next thing I would say is let's create a plan. Let's, you know, reach out to NDSS. We reach out to these, you know, supports that we can really help be proactive because it is going to be a fight. Um, but find your, I would say, find your community and then, you know, let's get going and, and create an action plan. Yeah. And sometimes it is a multi-year plan. I mean, I have students who, when I first, they first came on my clay slowed, were completely segregated. And I would love to say we got them fully included in that first year, but that's not the reality. The reality is we had sort of this integration process and they're now fully included. And so it's, it, it can be a process and each, for each student, it looks different. That's not saying that each student will shouldn't be fully included, not at all, but by the means at which we get there can be different. And we need to look at the individual the individual scenario. I would also say, you know, it's interesting on, on these groups, we have to be careful about state by state that we live in. Sometimes I'll get frantic calls from um, families and I'll say, I read this on the Facebook page and they say, I'm not, my child's not going to be able to get a diploma, for instance. This is one I hear a lot. And, yes. and I say, you know, it's very state specific. So I think ensuring that before we, you know, we panic, we, we talk to some folks who really have the expertise mm-hmm. and then also know that it's not, not the end of the world. Things like diploma tracks, that's a state by state issue. Yeah. Things like funding that more or less is a state by state issue. Um, But overarchingly, um, you know, we have folks who have those expertise. So utilize these pages for that support, that troubleshooting. Um, But then if you have any concerns or anything sending you into a panic, reach out, you know, Mm -hmm. to to us. Yeah. Well, and even to your point there, Sarah Jo, state by state issue, sometimes it's district by district within the same state. Absolutely. I mean, it's not state for me. I was going to say, Marla, <laughs> you've, you've even mentioned just, you know, 15 minutes down the road. It's Absolutely. a different place. It's you know. totally different. It's a different scene over there. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes that's what those pages can be can be great about. If, you know, you're saying I live 20 minutes down the road in, in a much more inclusive setting, as much as we want to fight for our homeschool to be that after five, six years of fighting, you know, where are we at in realistically, is it better for the student mm-hmm. to, you know, for us to make kind of a drastic, a drastic decision on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, lo- I want to jump in with another question here, Marla, before we go into the next one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so thinking about, you know, those are the great practical advice, you know, for parents, you know, who, who face that daily struggle. And I'm thinking, I, you know, I think of Martin Luther King Jr. who said, you know, I have a dream that one day, my kids and your kids will be, mm-hmm. you know, uh, together. I, I'm, you know, 47, I'm, I'm getting <laughs> older, but, but I do have a dream that one day that this isn't, 
a thing that we have Absolutely. to fight for that, that yeah. really and truly it's just what we do. Absolutely. And so what is maybe the NDSS, like, what are you doing maybe from a, a legal perspective, from a, mm -hmm. a, um, a government perspective to try to make changes at that level. Absolutely. Does that make sense? No, absolutely it does. I mean, I always I always come back to the quote of we'll know inclusive education is a reality when we have to when we can stop using the term inclusive mm -hmm. education. Exactly. Right. <laughs> we certainly um, as a member I am a member of the NDSS policy team. So we do proactively look at, you know, different bills that are coming up, things like when IDA is going to be reauthorized. We're we're very proud of our strong relationship our bipartisan strong relationships. Um, so we do form those um, those relationships with lawmakers. Right now, you know, there there isn't doesn't look like IDA is going to be reauthorized. So we are looking at some state things that we've talked a little bit about on our task force call. So about some some possibilities for some state some um, state by state things we can do. We've also really talked about because we are lucky enough to have educators and university professors on our task force that really some of some of the problem we're seeing is the inadequate season our teacher preparation programs now, i was lucky enough to go to syracuse university uh, for <laughs> <laughs> so i was i was constantly surrounded by this message of inclusion i was you know it was expected it was you know when you're sitting in julie dr julie Costin's class you know, you don't, I mean, you have no better teacher, right? Than, right. than <laughs> one of our guest speakers last season. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's not, that is not the, the I think norm. That is not the norm. So right. we look at, you know, when we talked about this actually two times ago in our task force call of, right. is there a way, you know, university, state by state, university to university, better to embed these inclusive messages and require inclusive inclusivity in their teacher prep programs because nobody gets into education to hurt children, but there's just a lot of misinformation out there mm -hmm. about what is best for our students with disabilities. Um, and a lot of that starts from what is being taught in our teacher prep programs. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting you say that because I actually, you know, I, I teach uh, special education courses at a small mm -hmm. Uh, University of Northwest Arkansas, and um, I, I tell my students, and, and it's for regular educators, especially like classes that I teach. Yeah. Um, some of them, my graduate classes are for um, for um, special educators, but the uh, undergrad courses are for regular educators. And so I tell mm -hmm. them, I say, this is where I'm coming from, that every child should be educated in the classroom as much as possible, Absolutely. you know, and ideally all the time. You know, and so I come I come to my students with that with that same thing. And I look at it as a as a civil rights issue. I look at it, you know, um, and try to help them see it from that viewpoint. And so I'm glad to see that. And I knew Syracuse did that. You know, I, I, I know Dr. Julie Costin and and, um, and and I'd love to see more universities do that, because I do think that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Absolutely. And, and we certainly are, you know, growing as you know, I'm going back to pursuing a Ph.D. And when I look at. You know, sort of the the trajectory of these PhD candidates. Many of them are their goal is to go and to create, you know, essentially mini Syracuses at these different universities. So our hope is to get there. But I think about you know, my cohort I graduated with uh, for my teaching degree. There was you know maybe twenty of us, and I'm not in the field. I think of you know, but five or ten doctoral students getting hooded a year. You know, we we still need some of these grassroots effort while we continue on that. Yeah. Um, that systemic change in, at the university level. Yeah, yeah. Sarah Jo, I want to just pop this question because you just said, uh, I'll just pop this question in here. Um, so uh, from Mame, I can't say that name, but, mm -hmm. you know, you see their question there me, about how they can start talking to their state leaders. Absolutely. So, based on that. Absolutely. So that is, that is a great, a great question. And I think that's something I'm going to, if any of my tasks is probably the task force or a listener, like, oh, more assignments for us to do. But I think that would be okay. for our task force to, to engage with. And we can pull in some of our other members of the policy team to engage with and have um, some things that we can, you know, go into with our new, our buddy walk 10 law syndrome that's coming to a con congressional district near you. This would be a great great thing that we can continue to talk about. So absolutely look for that in the coming months. We will, we will get to work on that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great yeah. suggestion. That is good.
That is good. Um, actually, one more comment I just wanted to share for Anne Marie. Mm -hmm. um, I was just saying, co teaching needs to be taught as teachers earn their degrees. So it's just basically what we're talking about. Yeah. And that's actually a resource we just um, should be up on our website now, the different co-teaching models in a very user-friendly way for both educators and parents. And I was excited that it might our resource may be used at in one of the Syracuse University classes this year. So that's exciting. Oh, awesome. That's exciting. That's exciting. Well, and I, I, I have to announce that our, our local school district is moving toward a mm -hmm. co-teaching model. There's, I, I think they're still going to have self-contained classrooms. Mm -hmm. But um, they are moving to our co-teaching model. So those itinerant students that receive pull-out services are now going to get their services in the classroom, which great. is wonderful news. Great, great. So, yeah, we're moving in that direction. We're not there yet, but we're, we're taking steps. Mm -hmm. So it's good great. to hear. Every movement is movement, right, Brian? It is, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So. so I have a question here, and it's, it's a lengthy one, so I'm going to read it because <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> For my surgery. But anyway, it says, practically speaking, what can you suggest to parents who face schools or districts who struggle to make the modifications and accommodations needed to ensure that their child is meaningfully included? Mm -hmm. I, I touched on that a little bit. But. No, no, absolutely. And, and I hear so many times that we have, you know, parents who are staying up all night and making these modifications. And mm -hmm. that's part of the reason we at our inclusive ed program here at NDSS have let us help give the teachers the tools to do that. So we never want to, we decided to not do a model where teachers just send us things and we do it for them. Right. Our goal is to work with our teachers to give them the tools to create this. So you may have a teacher who's never, who's never, maybe not never accommodated or modified, but maybe to this level. So what we'll do is reach out and, sit with them and do it with them. And we have a gradual release approach where um, we still work with our teachers, but the goal is to have them do it on their own. So my, my advice would be to connect them with someone who can really sit down and help them do it. Because while, you know, we can send all the resources in the world, sometimes having that generalized into what they're doing, um, it's a little bit trickier. So I would say reach out to folks who can sit down and give the students to give not the students the tools, the teachers the tools to accommodate and modify. And now, Sarah Jo, um, is all is there a cost to the families and or the teachers for for your services? Yeah, so everything we do is at no cost to our families. For our mm -hmm. school districts, depending on the depending on the um the intensity of the project, um, there may or may not be cost associated, um, but we say cost will never be a bear. We will never turn somebody away, a school away because of the inability to pay. So, you know, if a school is looking for large scale systemic changes and we're going to have a multi-year project, we're working with multiple teams and that is somewhere where we would have, you know, a contract um, yeah. and some payment. In it. But if it's just, you know, teacher who Facebooks me or message emails me, we will never, never, um, ask them then to pay. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I used to do some um, uh, advocacy work uh, mm -hmm. for families in Northwest Missouri. Mm -hmm. And um, my wife didn't like it. But I was like, I can't justify <laughs> charging people to secure a fate for their child. Absolutely. It's supposed to be free, appropriate public right. education. Absolutely. And so um, I, I surely accepted donations, but I was not going to charge them. <laughs> right. I mean, we always we always accept donations to our inclusive education program. Right, right, right. right. But, but you know, we've, we've discussed it at length and we look at issues of equity, you know, and who can afford to pay and that we would never, you know, want to just be hitting a small number of families for it in a, or school districts, you know, I've been in Title I schools I've who may not have the funding and that should never be a barrier to inclusion. Right, right, absolutely, good. So, well, Jane, you've actually gone and presented, right? Because weren't you just like in Naperville, I think? Oh yeah, I, um, yeah, I travel, so a lot of times groups will have me and I did yeah. uh, actually last night a virtual training for a group in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, right. I was just in Minnesota a few weeks ago and I did a training at their Gigi's Playhouse. I, you know, groups will bring me in. I'm going to be on a panel in outside of Philadelphia on the 7th for an Intelligent Lives viewing. Yeah, and so 
Yeah. So awesome. awesome. I've, 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 uh, I think I'm the only one that has, has hosted an Intelligent Lives viewing in the state of Arkansas. Oh, awesome. At our university. We had one last spring, and then I now show it in my special ed classes. Oh, awesome. awesome. Micah's yeah. actually, I'll give Micah a shout out. Micah's actually a good friend of mine. Awesome. At the university, yeah. So it's sort of, I was like, Micah, I kind of feel funny about, you know, looking at your life like that. But Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, there's many ways if you just, you know, depending if it's a school, a parent group, you know, a mix, you know, there's always ways to get our inclusive ed program um, brought in. Awesome. Yeah. And, and there are many times where I pull members of the inclusive ed task force, you know, to, you know, speak with me, um, depending on the, you know, what what it's on and, and really where it is in, in the country. Sure. Right. Sure. Right. So, uh, Sarah Jo, thinking about, you know, resources and things like that, what, you know, and, and, you know, if I'm a parent, local school district, what, what are some resources that, that parents can tap into to help their local districts do inclusion better? I know you've got some resources there, but even just even thinking about, you know, I mean, obviously name what you have there, you know, at the NDSS, but also what, what are some local things that they can tap into that you might be able to help them with? Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, we have, you know, a plethora of resources and things that we do. I, I always say, you know, we'll do anything and anything that we can within in the realm of reasonability to make inclusion happen for students. Sure. Um, if there's, if we don't have a resource made, we'll make one. Um, but locally, you know, there are a lot, uh, there's a lot of value in, you know, definitely your local groups who may know, you know, kind of the intricacies in even, even your school, you know, go to this person over this person, you know, contact this person and CC this person on it. So I would definitely also reach out to, to your local group. Okay. Um, Good. So are you saying like the local Down syndrome associations in, that may be in your area? Yeah, and they may have an education um, program there that may be able to help kind of navigate the um, individual schools and then, you know, reach out to us with, you know, when you need, when you need support. Yeah, awesome. Good. Good. So, Sarah Jo, I have two questions for you. So, for our audience that's watching, what suggestions can you make for them to be able to uh, stay on top of, like, the policies that are being talked about right now? I mean, is there, is there any um, website they should go to besides the NDSS just to kind of stay on top of what's going on right now? Because I know it's a little crazy right there. Yeah, but this is certainly an interesting time in Washington. I think the best the best advice I could give is to join our our DS ambassador program who really have the inside scoop on policy regarding not just education, but student any legislation that's going to affect people with Down syndrome. Um, you can join our, our fund action and our, our alerts in that way. And I would say that that is the best way. Um, we do include different um, educational, of course, if there's something educational going on, I will pass it over to my colleague, Nicole, who is our manager of grassroots advocacy, mm -hmm. who will send that out to our DS ambassadors in our community that way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. And then if, if a family is interested in reaching out to you, do you, uh, do you want us to just leave your email address or yeah. how do you want them to get in touch with you? Yeah. Email is the best way to get in touch with me. Okay. I will make sure I put all that information um, in our comments below once, once I have the ability to type a little quicker. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah. Is there any, um, any other questions that, oh, is there a link I can get? Okay. I have to. Um, someone just asked, is there a link? I'm, I'm thinking that they're talking about for the NDSS. So again, I will make sure that I put all that information of how to get in touch with Sarah Jo below. Mm -hmm. And um, like Sarah Jo said, if anybody's interested in getting involved with the NDSS, mm -hmm. there's definitely options for you to get involved with what mm -hmm. the National Center of Society is doing. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, Sarah Jo, is there anything else that you can think of? I mean, we you know, asked several questions. Anything you can think of that you might say to encourage parents or teachers or those who are listening um, that we haven't really addressed? Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say, you know, I, um, I said this earlier, but this is a fight that we feel strongly is worth fighting for. And it's not does inclusion work because unequivocally it does. It's how do we get it to work. We talk a lot about individualized programming, but we don't talk a lot about individualized inclusion for our students. And we'll hear, I'll hear a lot, well, it doesn't work with our co-taught model that we have. Well, then we need to move on and move our puzzle pieces around because it does work. And 
So there will be lots of times we'll all help teachers modify something and it doesn't work and then but that's something we can then use to move forward so every piece of something that doesn't work is just a way that's going to get us closer to what does work yeah. um, for parents on there my biggest piece of advice for you of ieps coming up is number one make sure you get the iep draft ahead of time number two bring somebody with you whether that's myself another advocate or even you know, a friend of yours who knows nothing, you know, maybe doesn't know anything about education because these are emotionally charged things. And sometimes just having somebody else there to help listen, help take notes. Um, yeah. Hold your hand. Hold your hand <laughs> is, um, can be so, so beneficial. It is. Um, and reach out. There are no, no stupid questions. We don't, um, I don't think we as, as educators have done enough to help parents really understand because I think a lot of times educators really don't understand in some cases, what goes into a really quality, great, inclusive IEP. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Never, never feel free, there are no, I said this to an administrator today, there are no stupid questions in this yeah. round. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I And I love what you said about just, you know, it's worth it in the end, because you think about, you know, those of us who are parents of children with Down syndrome, mm -hmm. you know, we are gonna be their biggest voice. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. until they develop their own voice and their own advocacy skills, we're gonna be that person for them. And so um, to think that that our children can be educated alongside other children and included, you know, um, is is very emotional, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to to feel like you can go into a meeting with confidence, mm -hmm. even though I'm an educator and I go into meetings and I still get nervous whether, whether my own kids yeah. meeting, you know, uh, but but you go in, you, you feel like you have confidence, you feel like, you mm -hmm. know, um, how mm -hmm. to speak up for your child. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that's so valuable because like you said, it is worth it in the end. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I think to the educators out there, it's really, it's really, I think hard for us not to be at that 10,000 feet level and see the trajectory of a student. It's really easy to get into, well, this is my year and this is what I need to get done in this year. But an understanding and knowing that this year of inclusivity is going to build the foundation and the building blocks for this life of inclusivity. And I think to, what my colleague Kayla McEwen says, and I'm sure everybody knows Kayla is the first registered lobbyist with Down syndrome. She's another manager of grassroots advocacy here at NDSS. And she says something in her speeches, um, she periodically, a speech that she gives periodically about, you know, when I was in kindergarten, I was the kid crawling around on the floor. Or, you know, I was in first grade, I was the kid under the table. And to me as an educator who has been in those first grade classrooms is so impactful because it's so easy for us to say, you know, we need to get this under control. If we don't get this under control, we're never going to get there to our end right. spot. But we look at Kayla, who has been fully included in all the amazing things she has she has done, and that ability to be included and what what that laid the foundation for. Um, yeah. What amazing thing she's doing. And look at where she's at now. She's amazing. And that's what I was just saying. Look where she's at. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and she and, and Kayla's wonderful, but Kayla's is is the rule, not the exception to what. Right. Yeah, what right. we can do yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely mm -hmm. well um i that's all we have i think marla is that right yeah no we appreciate you taking the time sarah joe well, and you know, again if anybody has questions even after the show is over please make sure you leave them in the comments because you know we can still filter them back to sarah joe absolutely. and i will again make sure that i put in the comments um how to get in touch with her and, um, you know, if you have any questions, please make sure you reach out to her because she's she's a wealth of knowledge and she's very flexible. So yeah, I appreciate everything that you're doing, Sarah Jo. Thank you. And thank you both for everything that you're doing to change this narrative on on our down on our community. We're, yeah. we're trying. Thank you. <laughs> thank you again. All right. All right, Sarah Jo. So it's great to have you. Yeah, and uh, Brian and I are going to just stay on for a couple more minutes. All right. Thank you, Sarah Jo. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. That was awesome. That was great. What a, that was yeah, what a great resource that they provide um, wow. for teachers and parents and, and uh, people with Down syndrome. What an awesome resource. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I mean, I just encourage people that if they have any questions to make sure, like she said, there's no stupid question. Even if you want to just um, offer your your teachers her email yeah. to you know get the help that you need. Um, I encourage you to do that. I enjoy being on the task force and I think we're doing such a dynamic work. And I just thought it was really important to bring Sarah Joe on just to kind of 
make sure everybody knows that we do have uh, some people in the, uh, you know, the higher ups yep. back. So uh, make sure. We do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, we are at the end of our program and we had promised last time that we were going to announce a book giveaway. Um, our last show, we had Heather Avis on and she has written a couple of books, The Lucky Few and her newest book, Scoot Over and Make Some Room. And uh, we asked people to comment in the comment section. And so we have Amanda, and I hope, Amanda, I'm going to say your name right, Laraga. Um, so I will reach out to Amanda and let her know that she is the winner of Scoot Over and Make Some Room. And so this we'll get that awesome book. book. Yes. <laughs> Just it for teacher gifts. <laughs> yes. What a great, great resource. And, and, mm -hmm. and Heather's got some just a just a wonderful story to tell. And I think you'll be yeah. blessed by that. So, um, Amanda, I will reach out to you and and we'll get your contact information and get a book into your hands shortly. Great. And Brian, do we know who our next speaker will be? We do. So we um, are going to have another show in November, November 21st, Thursday. Um, same time, I think 12 Eastern, 11 Central, and we are going to have Michelle Techner on, um, and she is going to talk to us about how she helped her son Raymond transition to a job. And uh, Marla, I know you and I, we are not there yet, but we are fast approaching. <laughs> We're getting there. Um, so this is this is kind of a world that's just a little bit outside of our world. And so yeah. we're excited to have Michelle join us. Um, she's going to be a, a great resource to, to help everyone just understand that whole world of transition. What's the next? What's the next? Uh, right. From, from school to the working world. And so um, you'll want to make sure to mark your calendars for November 21st, mm -hmm. noon Eastern, 11 Central for that uh, that program. Right. And I just I popped up a Monica's uh, comment here because, you know, she does have a little one. And, you know, Monica and anybody that's watching, just, you know, they're just stay positive. You know, you are your child's best advocate. And we are very excited, Brian and I, to be able to have this platform to share um, what we're doing here and just moving the 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 mission forward of, really? of changing the way people view individuals with Down syndrome again to see their capabilities and not their disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate everyone that um, was on our show here today um, yeah. on our live. And again, if you are watching on the replay, make sure you can still have the opportunity to comment and please share our show with others. We love to really get um, the word out about our show because we we do feel very passionate about what we're doing here and we'd love to get more people on Absolutely. our show live. And um, if there's anybody that you feel would be a good speaker, um, please let us know. Mm -hmm. So well, thank you, Brian. Uh, before we go, I just want to add also with what Monica said, she's got a, I think she said a preschooler if I saw that right. And, and so when you share our show, you're sharing it, not just with families who have kids that maybe are Marla's, you know, in my son's ages, but you're sharing it with family members who just got that diagnosis. You're sharing right. it with family members who have young children that haven't started school yet or who are entering preschool. And they're in that mix of it's hard and, and oh my gosh, my kid's doing things that they've never done before. And what do I do? And, and I love that Monica said it gives me hope because that's what we need. Because yeah. sometimes I think we get lost in our own or trapped, I guess, in our own little worlds and we that's lose true. hope. Yep. And, um, and so I think that, you know, if, if nothing else, you know, we want to move that needle forward on, on changing the narrative of how people see people with Down syndrome, but we also want to give people hope and we want yeah. them to yeah. see we that. Want to, to the families too, that absolutely. You know, pushing it forward and, you know, keep that vision for your, your child, keep that goal and uh, just keep going. Yeah. And it's not hard to share. You just click share and then <laughs> let it out there, you know. <laughs> A watch party like I just did. All right, just have a watch party. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. Well, don't right. forget next month, Thursday, November 21st at noon, 11 Central, we're going to have Michelle Tetchner on and uh, we'll see you then. Okay. Well, good. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for everyone that joined us and we will see you next month. All right. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.